Um, thanks to CCAT for the invitation to talk today about our technology we call MELD. Um, so this talk today is geared towards an audience. Uh, I looked at the registration um, and adapted this to a crowd who's a mix of uh, veterans of additive and maybe people who are interested in learning. Uh, maybe this is your first exposure to additive. Uh, so hopefully I have something for everybody. Um, if you got questions, let me know. I'll go as deep down the wormhole as you like. I was working a jukebox repair and we have jukeboxes made in the 50s. Parts were on them for the buttons, they would break. Where do you get them? Where do you get the little frames? So there was a shop we found that had a little 3D printer and we made parts that way. And that's the same story now, just for Mel, the parts are a lot bigger. Mel does a 3D metal printing. It's a new way to build some large metallic parts that was not possible in the past. This is a large scale, solid state metal additive process. So large scale uh, means we're printing parts, you know, typically a meter scale or larger. So that starts to reset the frame as to what kind of parts we're talking about. They're not parts you hold in your hand. Um, they're parts that, you know, make your machines, your ships, your, your tanks, your vehicles, whatever they may be. Solid state essentially means the metal is processed, deposited, and the parts made all below the melting point of that metal. We can process these metals that are problematic or impossible with the melt-based process. I came to Mel because I saw it as a chance to, to change the way things are manufactured. Right? When we started, it was convincing people this was a good idea. And now you go to conferences and you meet people who have graduate degrees in this technology we invented 15 years ago. Mel will be a topic of discussion in manufacturing classes, and it'll be the way parts are made from here moving forward. We're at that cutting edge of 3D printing. Some of the programs we have running behind me uh, are to produce materials that didn't exist 18 months ago. The idea that you could contribute to that uh, opportunity uh, was too good. And I think you got a building full of people who have a similar belief. Uh, it's pretty cool. So a quick overview of what we'll talk about today. We'll look at what is 3D printing very quickly. I think we're all up to speed now, but maybe not. Maybe there's people who are sleeping this morning. Um, we'll look at what additive friction stir deposition is. That's what we refer to as MELD. Um, a quick company overview, so about who we are, where we came from, why we do this, and then we'll look at some applications. So it was briefly mentioned this morning. Uh, are you guys aware of why I would have this, this spaceship uh, uh, up here on the screen? Anybody? Hmm? So this is this is printed, right? So this is a this structure, this this rocket was 3D printed by Relativity Space and was used uh, to launch uh, in, into orbit, right? So the idea that this is a burgeoning idea and may be useful someday um, is maybe not accurate. There are quite a few uh, companies and industries that are rapid, uh, not rapidly that are, have deployed this technology. So it's possible you've been in a vehicles, that you've touched 3D printed parts that you did not aware, you were not aware of. You may have 3D printed parts inside your person right now, you may not be aware of it. Um, and so the scale that additive manufacturing touches is immense. It goes from micron size parts. So if you go back to the 70s and 80s when we looked at um, MIMS devices, microelectronical mechanical systems, really small things. Uh, you had to use a, a microscope to see how they actuated. Up to ships this size, um, the, the scales are, are, are huge. Uh, and the materials are huge, right? So we've talked this morning about metal, that's the theme here. Um, but probably everybody's first thought of additive is plastic. But in fact, uh, materials can range from things you can eat um, to, to concrete, making concrete printers. Um, tissue, human tissue can be 3D printed. Uh, so it's it's a huge it's a huge um, spectrum we're talking about. So what is 3D printing? Um, so on the left here we have an image that I think maybe comes to mind for most people when they think about 3D printing. Certainly when I tell somebody I work for a 3D printing, I assume they think of this a plastic printer. You see some over here. You can get them for a few hundred dollars off of Amazon. I encourage you if you have not 3D printed. 
to take the plunge, get a little 3D printer. Uh, once it shows up about a day, you'll be up and running and you'll understand the pain points. Just imagine bigger and worse, uh, the newer the technology gets. But fundamentally, they're the same. So you need some material. It could be chocolate, it could be metal. I'm gonna talk about metal, we print metal. Um, it feeds, goes through a nozzle, an extrusion head, and then it's somehow it's heated up um, and it's deposited one layer at a time from the digital file, and this process is repeated layer after layer until your part is realized. So on the right, we're seeing a time lapse of a, uh, a meld part being made. Um, and you'll, you'll notice some, some differentiations just, just watching this happen. Um, in, the, in the video, uh, I mentioned it's a solid state process. Does everyone understand what solid state means? And I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more. It simply means we're not melting the process. And like the last presenter mentioned, um, it simply means the metal is below its solidest point and it's never going through that phase transition. Um, and I'll talk about why that's maybe advantageous a little later. Um, we're not using a powder at all. Uh, we actually use a solid bar feedstock and we'll talk about that, but that's got some economic advantages uh, as well. Uh, and it's, it's occurring like a normal CNC. So if you run CNCs today, this looks very familiar, right? It looks like a milling machine, except this one puts metal on rather than taking it off. So I asked ChatGPT to write me a joke uh, to, to kind of break the ice, uh, and this is what it came up with. So this is not uncommon. Um, 3D printing makes a lot of promises, uh, and without due diligence on both the, the, the company you're talking with about the technology and your own team, um, the disappointment can show up, right? So whether you're wanting to push the deposition rate, you want to push the envelope by material, by application, we'll look at some different applications, um, and different modalities for additive, uh, specifically for, for the additive friction start deposition process, but um, I think they're pretty ubiquitous across the board. Um, but ideally for any of these manufacturing processes uh, and with the additive focus, uh, you need some material and it's either gonna be um, wire, powder, or bar. I think that kind of captures 99% of, of the, the forms. There are some foil-based metal additive processes. Um, and then the technology you have, you saw some SLM, which binder jetting was mentioned, that's the desktop metal um, type applications, wire arc additive, uh, cold spray, AFSD. These is not exhaustive, but these are different lists. Uh, and you'll see some, uh, some discussion and some desire by the industry, the 3D printing industry, to group these by different capabilities, different, uh, different categories. And it, it is difficult. So how do you group them? Is it by the feedstock size? Um, is it by the, um, the solid state versus uh, melting state? Um, it, it makes sense why you'd wanna do that, um, but it, it's a hard thing, it's kind of a hard thing to do. So um, the way I use this picture, if I have to find the closest analog to walk somebody through AFSD, I'm gonna pick FDM. It's not metal and it actually melts the plastic. So not what we do at all, but conceptually, we have feedstock that goes through an extrusion head and we deposit the material. Um, and we would say it's plastically printed, but it's plastic, if not printed plastically, it's printed in a melted state. It's kind of confusing. Um, all right, so what makes MELD unique? Uh, the first is materials, and this is really turned on by the solid state nature of the process. Like the previous presenter, uh, this material is never brought above its melting temperature. And so all those alloys um, that may be challenging to process in a molten state uh, are now on the table for 3D printing. So um, typically in metal printing, stainless steels, uh, titaniums, um, they're, they're pretty prevalent. And that's really driven by those materials are pretty forgiving to how they're processed. They can be melted, they can be welded, right? So if they're weldable, it's probably a good, com good, good material for 3D printing. If it's not weldable, now you need some process that's solid state. If you have one, it's a good candidate. So we do a lot of aluminum, we do a lot of titanium, uh, we do a lot of copper. Um, and we'll look at a specific application for the 7000 series aluminum the previous uh, presenters spoke about. Um, size, uh, so as we look at the process that open air nature of it, um, 
the solid state nature of the fact that we're not using powders, that we don't have arcs and lasers and vacuum chambers, um, it enables us to make really big parts. So we'll look at some um, really big machines that make really big parts later on. Um, but these parts, we're, we're not talking parts you hold in your hand. These aren't, uh, you don't buy a meld machine to make tooling fixtures for your shop. It's a terrible waste of your money. Um, our resolution is not great, right? Uh, it's great for a spaceship, not great for uh, this microphone, right? You would just get a big, massive metal, and I would say it's not a good idea. Um, but if you want an 800-pound Bradley tank hatch, it's a very good application. This takes about 30 hours to print. But this part was all finished machined. So the parts on the left and the right are as deposited. The part in the middle is finished machined. Uh, and then speed. Um, for, for the 6061, so comparable to the last talk, um, about 30 pounds an hour is what we put that down at. Um, the machines can put it down up to 50 pounds an hour, uh, though that's beyond what we qualified at the moment. So the process is uh, pretty simple. Um, given all the complications, I'm going to try to gloss over. Um, what you're seeing is a process happening in real time. So at the center of the top of the screen, you see the rotating tool. This is a non-consumable tool. It's like your end mill, except unlike the end mill, it's not taking metal off. It's depositing metal. So this, as this tool is rotating, the solid bar of material is fed through the center of that tool. And th through a combination of force <coughs> and rotation, we create enough energy to plastically deform and deposit that material at the point of the tool is, is located. Um, additionally, the material being deposited is also mixing with the layer beneath it, creating a fully dense metallurgical bond between what you have printed and what you are printing. From a control standpoint, we're really concerned about four, four key parameters, the tool rotation speed, <coughs> material feed rate, tool traverse rate, and layer height. So material feed rate is how fast that material is being deposited into the tool, and the tool traverse rate is how fast your tool is moving along um, moving along the tool path. Layer heights can range from one to four millimeters, um, though typically we're around two millimeter layer heights. That can be dialed in for the application and the material. Um, tool traverse rates can range from 10 to 50 inches a minute. just depends on the alloy and the build strategy. So I think <coughs> we see additive manufacturing um, can kind of in general be lumped into this same type of graph. So this one specifically for the technology I'm speaking about. Um, and it's, it's where we sit today. And I'm showing five of the major modalities for this technology. My examples and what I'll talk about today is for the top part manufacturer. Um, but some really compelling cases can be made for repairs, coatings, feature addition, and joining. And all of these are pretty much the same. We're depositing metal onto something. But the end use and the life cycle after the deposition can be quite different. And the value proposition can be quite different. <coughs> so each and each of those modalities can be explored both from a sustainment look as well as a future looking opportunity. So I think the most common application at the moment is on this sustainment tail where we're looking at um, improving lead times. We're looking at um, repairing parts that could be repaired if there was a way to do it. Um, being able to produce parts uh, that are no longer manufactured uh, either at all or domestically. Um, these are very common, right? I'm sure this is what Jeff gets asked about. This is what propositions we heard about previously. Um, but the most most exciting, perhaps, is the creating the future. So as we look at <coughs> the applications, in particular the part manufacturer um, for, this, for this talk, we'll start to see that the materials people are looking for to replace parts they can no longer get um, were kind of married a long time ago. So we'll look at aluminum 7075. I have an example uh, to talk through. But that's a material designed for rot product, right? And when I say rot product, I mean forging, extrusion, and rolling. So plates, bars, and big billets. So that alloy 
was developed for those processes, and those processes were fine-tuned for that alloy, and at the end, we have all these parts we like today. And so now, when you want to look at an additive solution, you either need uh, a way to process those materials like you did in the forging, extrusion, rolling, and it happens to be those three processes are also solid state. So that's nice. So the alloys lend themselves to that. So as soon as you try to take a, an alloy that was designed for a solid state process and put it through a melt-based process, you may expect some challenges because the alloy was never designed to do that. Um, but what you'll also see in the additive world, especially at the forefront, the cutting edge of materials, is developing materials to leverage the advantages of those technologies. So we heard about the <coughs> uh, leveraging the fast cooling rates that you get in powder bed versus the casting process, right? That's not fighting the past, it's embracing the future, right? But that takes time as well. Um, and the same is true for these solid state processes. We heard the, the novel ability to um, take the aluminum powder, add a coating to reduce its uh, interaction with the environment, improve its safety. Um, that's, that's not fighting the past, that's, ad that's adapting to the technologies you have to leverage the true power. And that should be encouraged and pursued even further, especially as we get into hypersonic applications and we try to reshore domestic production of these, of these structures. If additive manufacturing is a big part of that, um, yes, you can keep making old materials that were designed um, before most of us were on this earth, um, or we could continue to invest in not only technologies, but the materials that go with them uh, to really make some compelling parts. And when you do that, um, the business case in, uh, is intriguing. It's very difficult to make because what do you compare it to? You could never make that before. So in the example where you're making a tool die, which you could make today, but you could make it faster or maybe um, slightly cheaper, if you can fundamentally make a product that outperforms um, or enable something like colonizing the moon, colonizing Mars, putting people, make, making commercial space, right? The way... Um, Blue Origin and SpaceX are launching as frequently as they are is not because they're waiting on forgings to come out of Russia and China, right? They're 3D printing stuff. Relativity made their own spaceship. They didn't ask anybody for a supply chain. So you can take control of your own products. You can make things that nobody else can make before, and that's pretty powerful. So at MELD, um, we've been working on this technology for about 15 years now. We commercialized in 2018 with the intention to be a machine. Um, builder and supplier, so our main fun function is on selling equipment, though we do some material part qualification and part manufacturing. Um, in 2018, as I mentioned, we we, spun, we we announced ourselves as a company, we brought our technology to market, um, and we're recognized at the first rapid we went to as the most innovative new technology, and in the same year we got the R&D 100 award for most disruptive new technology. And we've been fortunate enough to continue to receive recognition amongst our peers and customers. Um, and most recently, last year, winning the technical competition at uh, the Additive Manufacturing Users Group, which was voted on by the community. Another unique um, position for MELD is we are the inventors of this technology. So additive friction stir deposition um, is our invention. It's our baby. It's all we do. Um, we're not... We're not in this because we think it's a good way to make money. We do this um, because we really believe that it will change the way the world makes parts, and that's a very exciting proposition to our team. Um, we currently have 17 patents around the technology here in the U.S. and, and more abroad. And like I said, MELD <coughs> is how we talk about the technology, but added a friction stir deposition. I think the agenda called it friction stir additive manufacturing. Um, it's, all, it's all the same thing. So long as you're talking about it, I don't really care what you call it. Um, so as a company, our goal is to deliver delight to the customers, to the machine built, to the machine users, to the end users of the parts. Um, our vision is to disrupt manufacturing, not only here on Earth, but also in space. And that's a pretty big goal, um, but we're actively engaged on all those fronts. Um, and the mission is to deliver reliable equipment that um, is enjoyable to use. You know, I, I like hearing these users this morning talk about uh, the excitement their teams have about the technology. I think that's a big um, focus of ours as well, is workforce development, education, training, um, at both the user level all the way up through the, the management um, and ownership to make their, them comfortable with what we're doing and how it works. And I'll talk more about that um, later on. 
we do sell machines, so um, we have some options. The L3 to the 3PO. Uh, so as you go left to right, the machines just get a lot bigger. Um, and <coughs> at, the, at the far end, the 3PO is what we would call a hybrid machine. So that's the additive and subtractive capability. And I'll, I have an example. I think the last example is on exactly that. Uh, at the moment, um, there's about 25 different sites around the world uh, that you can go explore the MELD technology. Um, some have more uh, capability than others. Um, and I would say there's about 100 active researchers working on the technology, which uh, is very exciting for us because there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, and we're just at the tip of the iceberg of what, what really can be done. So I'll try not to go too deep into this, um, but I think this may be the first. Are people comfortable with what I'm showing up here? Metallography? All right. So aluminum 7075 is a great material to, to talk about. Um, one, it's, it's used basically in every industry that makes large structural components. It's a high strength aluminum alloy. Um, I would guess every, if you flew here, your airplane had this alloy on it. Um, and if you didn't fly here, uh, your car probably has it on it or the truck that drove by you has it on it. It is a tricky material. Um, from a standpoint of how you process it, like I said, it was it's really designed for solid state processing. And again, because MELD is a solid state process, it's a good candidate for this um, for this application. So we're starting here kind of putting um, the spoiler alert here. So we see here in the gray ASTM requirements for the alloy. These are um, the two different tempers, right? So T6 and T73. Uh, and then in the green is the, the MELD's response to those heat treatments. So are you guys familiar with aluminum? Is, by show of hands, anybody not familiar with precipitate strength and alloys? All right, nobody's, okay. I'll assume you don't know. So uh, we, we, we hear a lot about heat treat, and this gets confusing in metal additives because heat treat is a very broad word. Um, and in this case, the heat treatment is not to improve density. It's not to um, bake out the part or take it from a green to a finished state. In this case, the heat treatment is a solution quench and age. So the alloy, aluminum 7075, was designed a long time ago um, with the realization that to get the strength that you want for your part, it had to go into an oven, get to a solutionizing temperature. This causes some chemistry to change inside the metal at which point you drop it into a vat of water, it quenches, that's the quench part, and then it goes back into a furnace for an aging cycle, and that's how you get to your temper. So when you see any kind of aluminum dash T some number, uh, that's just the temper it was done. So that's the, that's the requirement of the alloy. So any process that produces these materials at some point was heat treated, whether it was plate, extrusions, forgings, melded, B3D'd, <laughs> both great has to go through a heat treat to hit those tempers. It's okay. Uh, and so we're able to do that, which is great. Um, and so I'll walk you just through how we went through a qualification for a specific customer. Um, we relied on a document called MNPDS, which outlines a statistically significant level of testing to demonstrate some level of repeatability in your process to say, hey, it's under control and I can depend on this process to make materials um, for my product. So. To do this, we printed test materials that were then sent out to third-party facilities for uh, heat treating and then testing. So once the part was printed, it went to the same facility that would heat treat your forging, uh, and then it was sent to the same test facilities that would do the, the proof to say, yeah, the material was heat treated correctly. So we print, we heat treat for an AMS heat treat, we test, we validate. Uh, and this is what the test blocks looked like for one of the configurations, just a simple box. Again, open air. Nothing special about that. You can watch the part be printed. Not very exciting. It's very good when it's not exciting. Yeah, that's our resolution. So that's this track, the way the machines are configured, it's about an inch and a half cross section. So again, we're not making small stuff. Yes, sir. Uh, saw? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I talked briefly about five modes. 
one of those modes is feature addition. And that's a very common uh, application, especially for ground vehicles, where they, they take massive plates and machine their structures out of. So the value add for them is by a thinner plate, build up where you want it. And so in that case, the parts, the plate's part of the, the build plate's part of it. In this case, we're just gonna bandsaw that part off. Yeah. We have a very large bandsaw. Yeah, so if at some point you gotta cut it off the plate, it, these don't pop off with a hammer. Like it, it's one and the same now. Uh, so tensile testing, now I have another standard up here. So I have two standards and aluminums, metals in general can be a little complicated with qualification and standards. Um, so you'll see here two different standards <coughs> for aluminum 7075. And we also have two different ways to make it, plate and die forging. So if you dig into aluminum standards, you'll see not only is there standard expectations for performance, but it's also driven by how you made it, um, the orientation you're testing it in. So this idea of the isotros uh, isotropic material, have you guys had this discussion? So I'll sit here and tell you our material is isotropic. And maybe somebody in here wants to say, ah, those aren't exactly the same, it's not isotropic. I concede, you're right, they're not exactly the same. But I would then ask for, show me isotropic material, and then I would concede that, yeah, it does exist. Um, but when, when we say isotropic and additive or any manufacturing process, what we're saying is that regardless of orientation, you have, this, you have the same minimum level of performance. You're not giving anything up based on how it's loaded. Now, in some of these manufacturing processes, like rolling, like extrusion, you can actually exploit um, non-isotropic behavior to get preferred strength in one direction versus the other. And we'll see that in some products we get asked to replace. And in those cases, it's very difficult for us to do because as we see, we don't have any this real difference in orientation. So we can't preferentially create strength in one direction over another. Uh, unfortunately, it comes out all the same, which is typically good, but just beware. Um, but all this is to say that the material it satisfies the forging requirement for this product in tensile testing, regardless of orientation, X, Y, or Z. Compression testing, uh, the same result satisfies the forging requirement. Chemistry testing, because when there's no phase change, it's not reacting with the environment. Um, there's no change in the chemistry. So the feedstock that goes into this material is an extruded product from any of your normal aluminum suppliers. So the chemistry it has going in, the chemistry it has coming out, um, which is great. Density. Um, my final pet peeve of the talk, I believe. <laughs> um, there's a talk this morning about density being um, 99.963%. Who disagrees that that's not dense? Seems pretty dense. I mean, that's three decimal places. Um, I, I, I don't like the word being used. Um, it, it's metal. I do not change the density of the metal. I, density gets conflated with porosity, uh, and it's confusing to, to suss that out. So just if, if you're new to metal additive and you see the word density, they're probably trying to convey something about the level of porosity in the part, not that the metal somehow atomically different. Anyways, metal fully dense. I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, <coughs> fracture toughness testing. Um, so we do see start to see some differences in performance based on orientation. So one of these is parallel to the layers for the fracture toughness, and the other is through the layers. Um, all I'll say is in both in all cases it satisfies the requirement, and it's not unusual for aluminums to have uh, different performance based on this type of test. Not shown here is fatigue data. We just got that in, um, but the fatigue data, uh, high cycle fatigue data is outperforming the ROT product as well. So we're very happy with our ability to produce 7075. So if you're interested in that, uh, happy to talk about that. All right, some cool applications. So this is a tooling thing we've made for a customer. This is the composite layup tool. Uh, finished machine is 800 pounds. Um, this was a 35 hour print. Um, once it was printed, it was sent off for finished machining. And we delivered this part to the customer in about four weeks, all included for $42,000. All right. Does anyone want to guess what the billet from the forging house to start with cost to make this part? Yeah, he mouthed 50,000, it's $45,000. So we delivered a finished part for 42. The block to make this from traditionally was $50,000 or $45,000. You want to guess how long that block was away from their order once they placed it? Yeah, about six months. I don't know. That's pretty good value add. I don't know what to say. Um, <coughs> so 
great. If you, if you, if you make big tooling, this is a pretty good use. Uh, so this is a trailing edge hinge for a F-18. This part was made um, by some of our collaborators at University of Tennessee and Boeing uh, to, to, to serve their supply chain needs, right? They can't get this part. It's, and they can't get the part because they can't get the billet, right? But if you have the ability to make the billet and then machine, it's great. So <coughs> I'm kind of hitting on this. I will, I, I, I could not say this, but I will. I will get a question, I would guess, um, can you make it thinner? I'm gonna think when somebody's gonna ask me that question, it's probably the first question I'm gonna get. Um, and yeah, you, you probably could, but this part, you know, this part, I delivered it finished for less money than it would have taken you to machine it out of a giant block. Um, so yeah, I could print this nearer net, but why? Um, because it's gonna be machined at the end of the day. So our value add is not, eliminating machining um, we're just making you turn chips faster in the part printing so just think oh if i can mach my machine sitting idle i could turn you on in a couple days same true for this part okay um so the jointless hole program is a congressionally funded effort uh, to enable the army the ability to print tanks right so if you i remember uh i don't know back when napster was happening you guys remember Napster downloading music? Um, one of the arguments the mu musician said is you wouldn't, you, it would be stealing if you downloaded a car and made one, right? And they said, I don't know if I'd ever do that. Now the government said, hold my beer. We're going to download and print tanks. Um, so MELD was selected as the printing component of that, along with our partners at Ingersoll, who made this machine behind me as well, uh, to deliver the Army two machines to enable them to print tank hulls. The smallest is operational now up in Sterling Heights. And the largest is installed at the Rock Island Arsenal and will be active next month. This machine has a print volume of 20 feet by 30 feet by 12 feet. This is the largest machine delivered today, but not the largest machine in, in the works. So the machines get very big. So again, you could go smaller, but why would you? Um, talk about, car, uh, am I running short on time? Yeah, I am. Um, so real quick, copper manufacturing is a big one for us. You see a lot of rocket nozzles 3D printed. The problem is, they're a little bit bigger than Mr. Bezos is. So the, the limitations on size are kind of hard to overcome for powder-based processes. Um, so MELD is working on delivering not only a copper um, product of that size, but also some hybrid parts. So I'll move to the quick summary of this, um, which is you're able to take an additive part, some subtractive machining, encapsulate cooling channels, and then finish machine the part and truly make a part that could not have existed before this process was enabled. Um, we had a quick challenge from the U.S. Uh, Navy to develop uh, a demonstrator part for HY-80, which is a naval steel, so we have electric boat people here. This is of interest. Um, so the <coughs> one morning, some material showed up on our dock, and by lunch, we had printed this component out of HY-80, um, and some of our government customers. So if you're interested, I can talk about that as well. Um, we're actively w looking for a way to elaborate with everyone in this room. Um, there's opportunities within the White House to AM forward, build back better, or engage on all those fronts. So, um, and even got a chance to speak with the Secretary of the Treasury, this is our CEO, Nancy, um, speaking with her about workforce development in particular, which again, we're very passionate about. And that's, I'll stop there. So this is us, if you have questions, let me know, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Chase. Um, we have time for a few questions, if uh, anyone. Oh, we have someone from the, uh, online. Um, so this is from our online group. Uh, what are the similarities and differences of meld and friction stir welding? Oh, great, great question. <clears throat> so they're both solid state processes. Uh, meld or additive friction stir depositions, the main difference is um, there's no pin tool. It's not for joining. It's for building up parts. So it, it, adds, a, it adds an extra dimension. This time not for disappointment, but height. So our second question is, does the geometry of the part need to be such to support the force applied in the Z direction when printing? Uh, yeah, it's a consideration. Although the parts are so massive, um, I understand what the question is. So the best example I have, we printed a two foot uh, hemisphere dome. So you can do pretty complex parts. The, the programming of the machine takes care of the 
challenges of overhang. So the slicing, that's called slicing. The pre the pre-processing part would handle that for us. And then what are the range of materials that can be printed with smelled technologies? <clears throat> any, any metal that when plastically deformed creates heat uh, can be printed. So any metal. Uh, so the next question would be, what would be the worst thing? That tungsten would be really hard. High temperature, it's brittle, uh, it's really, really strong. That, that would be tough. The, the, the equipment may need some beefiness added to it, but the, pr the process itself, uh, any metal. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, can you print with a fourth axis rotary, like on a tubular structure? And yes, yeah. So there's m many different modes of programming a 3D printing machine. That would be maybe the fourth mode is like uh, rotary application. And we have some demonstrations of that. Yeah. So two questions, if you would. Uh, the first, you mentioned encapsulation of cooling channels. Is my understanding that your technology would would fill grooves underneath the head and uh, not over over cover them? Are those lined with another material like stainless? Those are nickel tubes embedded in the part, and then you keep printing. So to prevent it, yeah, if those if those are just holes in the part as you print it over, those holes would be gone. And the second question is related to dissimilar metals. Yeah. Um, so if I wanted to put aluminum mm -hmm. on top of stainless, yeah. what type of bond would exist between those materials? Would it be gas tight, liquid tight, or would it be fully bonded? Yeah, it'd be liquid tight and probably be some sort of diffuse bond. We have some strategies to improve mechanical joining between those two as well. But yeah, it would hold pressure. 